Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for taking the time to join um, uh, for us for a Frontline Perspectives webinar on how resilient are Canadian medium-sized banks in the current environment. My name is Carl D'Souza, and I'm a Senior Vice President of the North American Financial Institutions Group here at DBRS Morningstar, and I will be the moderator for today's discussion. Uh, DBRS Morningstar's Canadian banking team covers issuers of different sizes in our rated coverage universe, and that includes the big six, medium-sized banks, credit unions, and credit union centrals. Today, my colleague Shokruk Temurov will provide an overview of medium-sized banks, or MSBs as we call them, and he'll speak to uh, loan portfolio compositions, profitability, uh, and net interest margins, along with credit portfolios and risk, funding and liquidity, and unrealized losses in the investment securities portfolios. Shokrook will be referencing two recently published commentaries titled Canadian MSBs to Remain Resilient Despite Increasing Credit Pressures and Canadian Banking Sector Market Volatility Continues But Funding is Stable and Unrealized Losses Appear Manageable. Following the conclusion of today's session, we'll have time to answer your questions. So please submit um, any questions at any time via the Q&A box on your Bright Talk screen. Without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Shokruk, who will take a few moments to introduce himself before getting into the session. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you, Carl. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Shokruk Timurov. I am Vice President, Financial Institutions Group um, at DBRS Morningstar. Um, at DBRS, I cover small to medium-sized commercial banks in Canada, as well as um, most of the uh, large credit unions. Um, uh, I joined DBRS two years ago. Um, so um, as Carl mentioned, uh, we'll be covering uh, medium-sized banks uh, in today's uh, webcast. And this is one of the first such uh, discussions we are hosting for um, external um, stakeholders. So um, I think we can start um, our analytical um, part of a discussion with the next slide. Um, we are, um, we'll see um, the list of uh, medium-sized banks at DBRS Morningstar uh, rates. So, um, Small and medium-sized banks in general in Canada um, are more sort of riskier segments uh, in, the, uh, in the banking sector compared with large, um, well-established, uh, diversified uh, Canadian banks. But at the same time, they are like as interesting as large banks. So the medium, uh, small and medium-sized banks in general, um, banks in general provide sort of viable alternatives for Canadian consumers and businesses in this in the specific regions of Canada, uh, and and they provide products where they have expertise. So, based on publicly available information, um, we estimate the total size of small and medium-sized banks operating in Canada is around under uh, 650 billion in assets. Uh, which um, makes up roughly like 7% of total banking sector assets in Canada. So as you can see, nine, about 93% of banking sector assets are held by big six, just to know that our calculations do not reflect the um, credit union systems. As, as, as you know, there are large credit unions um, um, operating in across Canada in different provinces. So... Um, Today, we'll focus on six um, medium-sized banks. So they are actually among the largest uh, medium-sized banks in Canada. So out of six banks, DBRS Morningstar rates five of them, uh, while ATB Financial is not rated. But we thought that for analytical purposes, um, uh, uh, providing some color and our insight, perspective on ATB financial in relation to other medium-sized banks would be interesting. So just to know that all of these banks except ATB financial is regulated by OSFI um, and they are Schedule 1 banks, so which means that they are subject to OSFI stringent um, cap and liquidity um, requirements. 
So um, with that, I think um, we can go move to the next slide where we will see uh, the loan portfolio composition of um, those six banks uh, by uh, product and as well as by geography. So as you can see on the right uh, left hand side, um, the banks, uh, medium sized banks um, have a narrower uh, spectrum of uh, products and services they offer in relation to a uh, large Canadian bank. So on the one extreme, you will see, for example, home capital and uh, the money life bank as a, um, mortgage providers, while on the other extreme, you will see, for example, CWB as a, a com commercial lender, um, uh, where 80 more than 80% of the assets in commercial segment. And in between, you will see Equitable, Laurentian, um, and ATB, ATB Financial. So among those six banks, ATB Financial and the uh, uh, Laurentian are more diversified. So where the uh, mix of commercial and retail um, um, is 50-50. Um, while Equitable um, still more exposed to uh, mortgages um, retail segment, even so um, it is expanding its commercial segment as well. And one characteristics of um, medium-sized banks is that um, they are less less diversified by geographies as well. So like originally they were um, established in specific regions of Canada and they actually grew in that region. Uh, and in recent years, they have started uh, diversifying the portfolio mix exposure outside their home provinces, I would say. So as you can see, except Laurentian, uh, most uh, uh, the medium-sized banks um, uh, do not have exposure outside Canada. And, uh, uh, but all in all, what we can see here is that equitable, for example, and home capital and money life is mostly exposed to Ontario. Um, while uh, uh, CWB actually is among, among uh, those who are diversifying pretty well in recent years. So uh, as you can see on the chart, um, but uh, the geography it has now, it, it is having good mix of uh, the geographic, uh, geographically diversified lending book. So um, uh, with that, um, uh, on the next slide, uh, we would like to talk about the uh, uh, profitability as well of these banks, given their business model, given their uh, uh, product and services they provide. So um, as you can see in general, um, medium-sized uh, banks, um, in terms of name, somewhat more profitable than large Canadian banks, and this largely explained by the, the, the type of assets they have exposure they have on the asset side, which are pretty much high yielding assets. For example, if you look at the CWB uh, as a commercial lender, uh, the yields are quite good. Um, and the similar argument you can make on um, the equitable and home, for example, as a OTA providers, mortgage providers, they, they, they are yields also good. But at the same time, these high yields um, offset to a certain extent by high funding costs. Generally, as we'll be covering in the upcoming slides, um, uh, these banks have less diversified funding sources and they have um, uh, sizable exposure to uh, depo uh, broker deposits. As a result, cost of funding as well is somewhat higher than the large big banks uh, offsetting the uh, the high yields on the asset side. Um, in terms of um, efficiency ratio, we can see very interesting dynamics and the com comparison contrast. So CWB, Equitable, um, Home, um, and Money Life actually have a decent, um, good uh, efficiency ratio. And this is largely explained by the fact that they have either limited or no physical footprint branch network, um, while uh, Laurentian and ATV financial efficiency ratio are relatively weak. And that's because they have a strong, strong branch network in the uh, home provinces. 
but at the same time, in certain in 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 the recent years, for example, Laurentian um, had um, some issues with the retail banking as a new management recognized and and, and eventually unveiled the new strat uh, uh, strategic plan to improve on the retail banking. So all in all, uh, so we can say that the profitability is good good content and the margins are stable, but the funding cost is higher and uh, revenue sources are, uh, are less diversified, which is uh, uh, in most cases um, the undiversified, fund, uh, undiversified revenue sources is a rating constraint uh, from our perspective, because that could make those banks susceptible to uh, credit cycles because of the uh, sensitivity of their assets to interest rate changes. So, um, thanks, Shokruk. Um, given, given that the MSP loan portfolios are not as diversified as their large bank counterparts, can you speak to uh, the credit risk and asset quality along with funding mixes for these banks? Yeah, sure, Carl. Um, so on this slide, yeah, we can see that the um, the bulk of credit risk in um, at uh, MSBs lie in the residential mortgages and commercial real estate loan portfolios because um, most of the uh, MSBs are exposed to one of or mix of uh, those two asset classes um, as we uh, uh, covered earlier. So all in all, this is like a snapshot of um, uh, some of the key uh, um, risk asset quality metrics parameters we look at and as a comparison we, like, we're providing the parameters for the six banks. So as you can see, except ATB Financial, um, in general, asset quality at MSBs remain quite good, um, as indicated by the impairment levels of the past few years. But for for today's discussion, they present displaying only two years as a comparison. But even historically, most of the uh, MSBs had uh, good levels, uh, low levels of impairment good underwriting standards and very minimal write-offs. Um, while ATB Financial is an exception here, it's because predominantly it's exclusively, I would say, concentrated in the province of Alberta. And despite having diversified portfolio, it has high exposure to CRE, as well as some volatile sectors and hydro, like hydrocarbon sector, oil and gas and, and other extraction sectors. And as you, as you know, these sectors have been uh, Experienced certain uh, issues in the past. So, uh, in terms of now the um, our expectations on the credit uh, uh, risk development for these banks, so we can just split it into um, uh, the residential mortgage side as well as the CRE side. So, in the residential mortgages, as you know, except Money Live, um, the uh, bank these banks have. To, uh, very, to very extend uh, exposure to Alte. And, and as you know, we consider Alte um, segment is riskier than the prime. So, and in the current environment of uh, high interest rates and, and, uh, and uh, the rising uh, living costs, uh, um, the, uh, this sector is more likely to come under pressure and the credit uh, risk likely to rise with um, the uh, lend, uh, lenders providing all the mortgages. So from that perspective, um, we view equitable and homes uh, credit profile more susceptible to real estate market downturn than other uh, uh, MSBs. Um, as indicated by our ratings, where equitable and home um, are in triple B category, while other banks in A or AA category. So um, now, in terms of CRE, um, I think this, this is another segment where we are concerned in general, even though certain segments within the CRE performing well, despite the COVID and all other macro challenges like industrial sector, but these banks have exposure to construction, hospitality, office and retail, and where we have uh, more concerns. Um, than the in industrial and uh, mostly uh, uh, residential uh, properties segment. Um, so from that perspective, uh, for example, uh, Laurentian has some somewhat more high exposure to uh, construction sector, even so, 
we recognize that there's um, uh, other mitigating factors um, and uh, the factors included in the underwriting standards, for example, the guarantee by the, 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 the guarantee provided by the external uh, stakeholder in case, the, uh, the equity holder in case, the uh, construction costs rise in the environment of higher inflation. Um, so there are some other factors, and as well as the Quebec relatively more so stable, and the market hasn't experienced sort of ups and downs or a boom and burst like in Vancouver or in, in, in Toronto in the housing market. So these kind of factors to large extent mitigate potential risks, but we remain cautious about medium-sized banks in general who have high exposure to pre-segment. So um, now with that, we'd like to move to our next uh, slide, which is on the uh, funding and liquidity. So in general, um, the, uh, on the funding side, the medium-sized banks have um, less diversified funding profile compared with big six. So as you can see on the chart, they are they have sizable exposure to broker source deposits and CBR Morning Star view this um, doesn't view that credit positive per se because broker source deposits are more vulnerable to micro and micro events happening in the industry and around the bank and uh, potentially causing the volatility um, the, uh, in the uh, risks and, and liquidity risks in, uh, as a result of uh, um, material events happening. Um, but at the same time, we know that the uh, small and medium-sized banks have been taking um, steps in recent years to diversify the funding source uh, uh, for example, by issuing covered bonds, and, and some of the actually banks are actively considering to tap the covered bond market, which would which we would be positively, of course. And at the same time, banks like CWB have taken a major steps in recent times, years, to uh, diversify its funding from the uh, broker source deposits, and and the numbers speak to themselves. So as you can see. It's uh, the, the share of directly sourced deposits rising, which we view positively. Um, um, at the same time, um, uh, we note that the, uh, uh, despite the uh, somewhat concentrated or less diversified funding sources, um, medium-sized banks have uh, sufficient liquidity buffers. So uh, given their business model and, and, and operate operational needs for cash and cash outflows, they hold uh, good levels of assets. So they all, as I mentioned, are regulated by OSFI, so they're subject to uh, liquidity requirements, guidelines. They follow the guidelines very well, and then they have, and they report these, uh, li uh, these uh, on the uh, liquidity metrics and the guide uh, to OSFI. And, and we know that the liquidity level coverage ratio, for example, is well above um, uh, the, the regulatory minimum. And at the same time, the, as, as a Schedule 1 banks, medium-sized banks have access to Bank of Canada uh, liquidity sources in case there is any major uh, events happens. So at this moment, we're not seeing major deposit outflows, but in general, nevertheless, we, we remain cautious that in the extreme, somewhat extreme scenarios, the, the medium-sized banks uh, would, be, would be exposed to the uh, liquidity issues than the large Canadian banks. And that is reflected in our ratings as well. And in most cases, for most institutions, the less diversified funding mix is a rating constraint. Thanks, Shokruk. Um, in, in light of the recent... Oops, sorry, I was on mute there. Uh, thanks, Shokruk. In, in light of the recent U.S. bank failures and global banking sector turmoil, can you uh, please discuss the MSB's investment securities portfolios, the unrealized losses on those portfolios that have resulted from the higher interest rate environment, and also the potential impact at capital levels? 
Yeah, sure, um, Carl. If you go to uh, next slide, I believe we have. Yeah, so the next slide actually display the um, unrealized losses, both in dollar terms uh, in Canadian as well as the uh, percentage of the total um, assets. So as you can see, the overall total unrealized uh, losses with um, the Canadian medium-sized banks quite limited. Uh, the proportion of the total assets is, um, is um, on average. It's uh, under, I think, 15 base points on average for these banks. Also, the level varies by bank by bank. So if, if, if you look at the chart, for example, uh, total loss and losses at CWB is uh, slightly uh, high, uh, above 30 base points, uh, followed by Laurentian is around 20 base points, while all other banks have a, a, a limited unrealized losses. But this doesn't mean that the Laurentian and CWB is susceptible to potential issues in case the banks have had to uh, liquidate their portfolio. Uh, for example, CWB, in the case of CWB, uh, these losses are uh, accounted under uh, uh, fair value as a uh, through as a comprehensive income, which means that it is reflected in the capital ratios. So there's no further um, uh, reduction uh, as a result of the sale of those um, uh, uh, assets. Um, for Laurentian, even though it's not part, it's not reflecting the capital. Overall, the uh, the, sh the amount is very minimal. So, um, in general, um, these banks hold assets in high quality um, fixed income securities invested in the, uh, the government of. Um, Canada bonds as well as uh, the, uh, the local provincial government bonds, and the maturity is quite low. And the one year, around one year, and the credit profile they typically invest in double and above uh, uh, rated um, securities. And the, as you know, the, the Canadian fixed income market is um, quite um, liquid, and particularly the uh, public sector uh, trade of public sector paper. So. We don't, so the overall portfolio quality is good. And in general, they do not hold, they hold the portfolio for liquidity purposes. They do not invest in, in, in speculative trading or some other purposes. And they have quite good hedging programs uh, in place so that to, to minimize the potential uh, interest rate related risks. So this, um, slide now shows actually the potential impact of from the uh, li liquidation of the investment portfolio if those banks had to liquidate. And as we discussed, for example, in the case of CWB, um, it's already part of the, uh, the reported CT1 ratio, so there's no impact. And for other banks like Home Equity Bank, uh, Home Capital, sorry, and uh, Equitable, it's very minimal. So the impact is, is almost uh, zero. There's somewhat impact you can expect for Laurentian if they had to uh, liquidate, but again, the magnitude is very small. So as a result, even in extreme case, uh, all else being equal in the extreme case, if they had to monetize those assets, we're not expecting um, the, uh, the, the potentially large negative implications for credit profile and, uh, sorry, for capital assuming that all other factors uh, remain equal. But as you know, in stress scenario, there, there could be some other factors um, and affecting other aspects of the business, but this is not so predictable. Um, and in general, um, so it, the way we look at the medium-sized banks is that they, are, um, they, they operate in the niche market and they are less diversified both in terms of the funding base, as well as um, as well as the uh, asset side on the asset side, and geographically as well, they are less diversified. So typically, credit uh, characteristics of these banks indicate to higher, somewhat higher risk than the the uh, large Canadian banks, as reflected in our ratings. So that this kind of this 
how memory um, is uh, it's provided on our next slide um, as a takeaway from our discussion. Um, and um, so with that, I would and if any questions, interesting questions, we would be happy to discuss. Well, yeah, and, and thanks, Shokruk, for your insights. So just going to the last slide, as you noted, um, it provides a summary overview uh, of some of the points Shokruk has raised um, uh, with regards to the MSBs. Do you want to uh, discuss any of these points, Shokruk, on the slide again? Um, sure. This last point, just to add here, is that um, the DBR Morningstar remains cautious about the banks in general in our portfolio. And the medium-sized banks are specifically under close monitoring, given that given this uh, recent event in the US and that they have somewhat riskier portfolios compared to large Canadian banks as well as the funding base is uh, less diversified. Um, and but um, so far, we haven't seen um, the uh, kinds of major stress happening with our rated banks, um, despite the recent events in the US. Uh, but we remain uh, monitoring our banks and we will update the market on our views as, um, as we go along. Great, Shokruk. Um, thanks again. And and so now uh, we are we're entering the Q and A to answer some questions. Um, so again, feel free to put any of your questions um, in the Q and A box on Bright Talk, and and we'll be happy to address them. So just give a few minutes, and then we can start that. And just before we, we start the questions, just a quick point that there is a feedback uh, button on um, the Bright Talk screen there. So feel free to provide your feedback. It's always value added and, and we're always happy to receive any type of feedback um, for future sessions that we hold. Okay, so to start into some of the questions, um, the, the first question Shokruk is, uh, in light of the recent U.S. bank failures and subsequent banking sector turmoil, do you have any concerns with the MSBs? And what are some of the things you're monitoring right now? Right. I think that's a good question as a follow-up on some of the points um, I, I mentioned early. So um, given the um, funding profile of medium-sized banks, I think in the stress environment, they're more likely to experience uh, the uh, liquidity issues or any um, bank operations re related issues first than um, diversified banks. Um, as you know, the block source deposits are very more sensitive than retail deposits to the macro and micro events, um, which might cause an issue for um, banks. And that's why we closely monitor our medium sized banks. Um, at this point, we haven't seen, per se, um, major issues or signs of uh, potential um, liquidity stress, specifically um, uh, as a result of the recent event in the U.S. So there are like different, there could be different explanations for that. I mean, first of all, um, as we discussed, um, unlike those U.S. banks, which experience the issue. The Canadian bank, irrespective of their size, is regulated by OSFI if they are regulated, so they're subject to the stringent requirements, including liquidity requirements. So, and as I mentioned, all of our rated medium-sized banks report on the uh, liquidity requirements, even so they do not disclose publicly. And some of them disclose, but maybe not all of them, but nevertheless, we always uh, remain we remain aware of so the, the liquidity levels and then any is potential issues they might be experiencing. And at the same time, um, the, uh, as a comparison and contrast, for example, the, uh, the problems, as you know, with the U.S. bank, specifically SBB, was related to homogeneous right, deposit base, which uh, was um, deposit from venture cap capital and private equity. So 
their corporate uh, deposits, and as you know, their like, corporate deposits tend to uh, reflect large accounts, single large accounts, and the more likely concentration risk within the corporate deposit versus retail deposit. So if most of our banks have mix of retail deposits, corporate deposits, as well as broker deposits, and they're not concentrated in a single industry. Even, for example, for CWB, even though it's commercial lender, right, but it has good, diverse, well-diversified exposure within the commercial segment, even though certain segments are more dominant than the others, but in terms of deposit based from commercial, they have from the, from the depositors um, and the companies in different segments. So it's kind of the, the risks and the issues caused um, at the SVB somewhat specific, I would say, but doesn't mean that there, there wouldn't be any problems with medium-sized banks, because at the end of the day, as you know, banking sector is very much impacted by the confidence. So as long if there is a lack of confidence, we would expect some impact on medium-sized banks as well. Okay, great, thanks. Um, next question, um, Aussie is currently consulting on proposed updates to its B20 guideline. One of the items being discussed is potentially tightening underwriting standards around debt service ratios. If this gets implemented, how do you see this impacting Alte mortgage lenders like Home and Equitable? Right. Um, this is another interesting question. I think likely there will be potential implications, but the magnitude to be uh, remain to be seen, given that of the depending on what will be the final revised uh, standards of OSFI, um, but the potential direction could be that some of the loans originations actually um, at the old phase segment could flow from those banks to uh, mortgage investment corporations, which are unregulated, right, and they not subject to these uh, stringent requirements. So this kind of, um, the Trend-wise, we can expect the direction toward there, but again, in terms of magnitude and in the implications for banks, um, uh, we have it remains to be seen. Obviously, I think the if um, if the origination flows impacted, we, we would see some implications on the uh, profitability side, of course, for these banks given these low originations, but. From the risk perspective, I think um, the various monies that view positively this uh, tightening standards, I think that further underpins and make the banks more resilient against the, uh, the, extern- uh, the severe shocks and stress in the market. Okay, um, just looking. Um, next question. Um, how do you view Laurentian's strategic plan that was unveiled in December of 2021? Um, under the new leadership and the progress they've made to date against that plan? Um, this is actually a question um, uh, we often actually um, get from um, external stakeholders. They're all sort of interested in that, like how the ABRS Monistar in general views this, um, uh, the new strategic plan. So as you know, uh, Laurentian unveiled the, the, the uh, new stra- uh, strategic plan and the new leadership uh, in December 2021. And so essentially this strategy fo- is focused on um, uh, improving the uh, retail segment of the bank, which has experienced few issues in recent years in terms of like loan book growth, in terms of deposit base, as well as uh, some operational issues in terms of mortgage uh, originations, or, and as well as um, uh, overall, this also looks at sort of improving and becoming more digitalized bank, um, because other banks progressing quite well, and, uh, relatively speaking, um, so they also want to improve on those segments. So now the question is, um, what uh, 
So how DBRS monitor views and what could be potential implications given that DBRS monitor relates to bank? Um, overall, it's quite positive, right? We have been um, uh, highlighting these things um, in recent times and discussing closely um, with the bank as well. Um, so we um, confirmed our ratings on um, Laurentian in, uh, last year in December and rating is stable. So this event is credit positive, but our ratings remain stable, indicating that um, uh, the ratings are unlikely to change in the short to medium term. But it doesn't mean that the first morning star wouldn't act on potential positive developments. As we always highlight, we could upgrade the Laurentian ratings, for example, if there's sustained improvement in the franchise momentum, which might result in sort of stronger profitability, which is somewhat, I think, the issue with the bank, with the other peers, as we discussed earlier, as well as um, improving its operating efficiency. So from that perspective as well, if the operating efficiency is somewhat uh, uh, lower. And this kind of developments could be accelerated by, by the bank's new strategic plan. And, and we always monitor closely and, and in general, DBR monitor study is that positively. Okay, um, next question. Um, the Basel III reforms, um, or majority of the Basel III reforms became effective uh, on April 1st of this year. Uh, what are the implications for the small, medium-sized banks of these reforms? Sorry, I was mute. I guess you're right. So I think they, the, the um, OSPI's new requirements became effective from February or April, depending on the fiscal year the banks uh, follow, like the sum of the uh, medium-sized banks follow October to October fiscal year. So for them, the guidelines became effective from, fe uh, from February, while for those who follow December to December fiscal year, the, the, uh, those um, requirements, guidelines, new guidelines reform became effective from April. Um, so now as per the OSPI's new guidelines, they are, um, they're more sort of structured, I would say, approach to um, classifying banks uh, and the, the medium-sized banks, small and medium-sized banks under three sort of categories, right? Um, depending on the asset size and some other considerations as well as clearly um, uh, highlighted, explained uh, on the uh, on public domain of OSFI. So uh, overall, our uh, issues, uh, medium-sized banks, uh, we rate uh, fall under um, category one. So category one essentially is the larger, large banks in the small to medium-sized bank space. Um, and in mostly smaller banks have a more simplified sort of approach to cap to capital requirements and in terms of calculating the, the capital. Uh, for credit risk, operation risk, and, and uh, market risk. Um, so for our banks, I mean, we're looking the, into this uh, more in the coming days and weeks, um, but we note, we understand that the impact would be minimal for our rated banks. Um, if there is a positive um, implications, for example, in terms of capital, there could be some base point increase in their capital levels. Otherwise, I think from the, speaking from rating perspective, this reform positively viewed, but might not necessarily mean any potential rating upgrades as a result of, as a result of some uptake increase in their capital relation, but we view them positively. Okay, um, and, and we have one more question right now. Um, and, and the last question is, um, Equitable recently acquired Concentra Bank, making it the seventh largest Schedule One bank in Canada. Do you see Equitable competing more directly with Laurentian Bank now after this acquisition? 
Yeah, that's a actually interesting developments. I think um, looking at this from equitable perspective, um, it is it makes it is actually good strategy to grow business and then you know diversify the funding outside Ontario, um, where the market competition is quite strong given the dominant position of large Canadian banks. Um, relative to, of course, um, Quebec, for example, but doesn't mean that Quebec is low hanging fruit either. As you know, in Quebec, the National Bank of Canada, the sixth large bank, um, has dominant position, right, in, in both on the funding side as well as the lending side. Um, and as well as Quebec actually has quite a strong network of cooperatives like credit unions under the umbrella of uh, uh, Desjardins Group, um, which means that, and at the same time, Laurentian also now uh, on the strategy is uh, targeting at um, uh, attracting more retail deposits and through digital channels, they are offering a new products. So there will be competition as well. And so, and th that could, might pose some challenges to uh, uh, equitable as well as Laurentian in terms of competition um, with some implications for funding costs, for example. Um, but nevertheless, I think if equitable can execute on the strategy well, um, I think they could manage the funding profile, improve on the funding profile and can manage and diversify actually their funding uh, sources. Okay, and then we just had another question come in. Um, how do you value banks with higher proportion of insured deposits? Right, um, I think all else being equal, um, um, the uh, Bank A, for example, with higher share of deposit insurance views favorably than Bank B, where the share of, let's say, insured deposits lower. Um, that's because the, uh, as, as, I, as, as we discussed, banking sector is not just about the, uh, the performance, the, like credit metrics or capitalization. It's also about the uh, confidence. And if there's a lack of confidence, then that might cause a huge issue for any banks, right? And, and the medium-sized banks sort of, uh, could become more susceptible to such potential risks. Um, but if, let's say, the uh, significant portion of deposit insurance, then these deposit holders would, would, wouldn't be inclined to sort of withdraw deposit and, 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 and move to different uh, banks. So likely, deposit remains sticky and more reliable source of funding if they are insured. That's the, in general how we view them. Um, so among the banks we rate like, the, 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 the dig, degree varies from bank, one bank to bank, but they're like decent size of deposits with our medium sized banks insured. Even so like in case of uh, BWB, for example, even that it's more commercial lender and you know the commercial deposits are not insured, but CWB has been holding strong relationship with with and its side borrowers given its historical track record. So we closely monitor all our banks in terms of how the deposit flows like, uh, behaving in, in the current environment. But yes, all else being equal, the same deposits insured positively viewed. Okay, that's all the questions we have right now. I mean, we can wait another half minute or so to see if any last uh, questions come in. Um, but during that time, while we're waiting to see if any other additional questions come in, just wanted to say uh, thank you to all of you who have attended this webinar, and we hope that you found our discussion informative. Uh, the presentation will be available shortly for replay on Bright Talk, um, as well as our DBRS Morningstar YouTube channel in the coming days. You'll also find one of our takeaway summaries um, on, on this webinar on the website as well. If you have any further questions for us, please feel free to reach out to us directly.
uh, again, thank you for your time today. Enjoy the rest of your day and also feel free to provide any feedback um, via Bright Talk. Um, again, we, we always appreciate the feedback uh, and, and incorporate it as best as we can into future sessions. Um, so I don't see any other additional questions. So with that, um, again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.